Our topic is ne Necropolitics Illustrated, the COVID-19 Pandemic, and the Photojournalistic Images Related to Brazil's Bolsonaro. Our presenter today is Andre Bomar de Mello. Before I introduce him, though, I invite Zara up to do our land acknowledgments. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So uh, we are gathered here on the lands of uh, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Nenapikwo, and Tonangukton. And these are the traditional lands. We acknowledge that we are gathered upon on this land, and Western University is located here. Thank you, and let's welcome Andre. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before we welcome him, I'll just do a brief introduction. I know for most of us in the room, we, know, we already know Andre, but uh, for the benefit of others, I'll, I'll introduce him very briefly, if I may. Andre is a media studies PhD student here at Western University's Faculty of Information and Media Studies, lovely known as FIMS. He graduated with a BA in Advertising and Social Communication from the Federal University of PE in Brazil, and he also studied at Birmingham City University. He specialized in public communications, and he had a Master in Media Studies from the Federal University of RN from last year, from 2022. Andre has more than seven years of experience as a communications analyst and as head of a local communications office at the Brazilian Federal Prosecution Office where he reports public interest issues such as corruption, fighting healthcare, and environmental protection. His research interests are related to public communication, environmental communication, political economy of the media, and misinformation, which brings us to today's topic. Andre's paper explores uh, the concept of necropolitics from Foucault's biopolitics and issues of sovereignty, and control over life and death. Necro necropolitics is applied to analyze how Brazilian President Bolsonaro was portrayed in his response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So rather than uh, rather than read from the abstract any further, I don't, don't want to steal Andre's thunder, so I'll leave it for Andre to take it from here. Please welcome Andre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming, for watching. So uh, yes, uh, this is a very challenging topic for me. I'm going out of my comfort zone to make this presentation today because uh, many of you know my uh, primary research interest is on an environment and communication. But uh, this, uh, the whole pandemic situation and all the social outcomes in many areas that we all know of really compelled me to uh, write and research and talk about it and the role of media in all these changes that are happening, it's still happening, right? So uh, today we have two goals here. Uh, first of all, I want to talk a little about the COVID-19 pandemic in Brazil and how it applies to the concept of necropolitics. And then we're going to analyze uh, how the media portrayed, how photojournalism portrayed uh, President, ex-president Jair Bolsonaro uh, during the, in relation to his response to the pandemic. So for us to start talking about necropolitics, we need to, to begin with the concept of biopolitics from Foucault and then move on to achieve events thoughts on politics and on sovereignty and power structures in society. So talking a bit about politics that I know that many of us are all already aware of it. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to get too in depth with it. We're just going to talk a little about it so we can apply it to the concepts that we want to, to the point to, that we, are, we want to get to today and to the Brazilian context of the pandemic. So uh, Foucault defines biopower as the power that exerts a positive influence on life, that administers, optimizes, and multiplies life, subjecting it to precise controls and comprehensive regulations. So when he talks about precise controls and comprehensive regulations, he's talking about applying political technologies to the whole space of existence. And uh, when, when he says that, what is he talking about? What's the whole space of existence? 
is everything that uh, concerns our, bio our bio biological life. So habitation, healthcare, uh, natality control, and everything else. So I want you guys to please help me. Uh, what examples can we think of that uh, applies to biopolitics in our everyday lives in our contemporary society? Can anyone help? Uh, whether um, birth control is funded or not? Yes, that, that's a very good example. Actually, any birth controls of some countries limit the number of children you can have. That's a very good example of uh, biopolitics. Also, every healthcare program, well being program, social benefits that try to make people's lives better and in better conditions. So yes, these are uh, all examples of biopolitics when we think about caring for life and making people's lives better, okay? So then when we start to move our thoughts to necropolitics, uh, it, it actually starts from this point when we talk about making life better. Uh, Foucault himself already said that the underside of caring about life is having power over death. So, uh, when you, you have the necessity to preserve a whole population's and individual's lives, you also have this downside of having the power to control, to have, of having control over that, of having power to say who should die or not. And uh, so starting from this point, uh, Achilman in Bam, he's a Cameroonian historian, theorist, and public intellectual, uh, very celebrated these days. And he crafted the concept of necropolitics based on the fact that for him, biopolitics is insufficient to explain the contemporary uh, powers that subjugate life to the power of death. The instruments that are used by politicians and by powerfuls and governments to uh, use death as an instrument of uh, sovereignty and of ruling. So uh, according to Mbem, uh, necropolitics is the policy centered on the large scale production of that. And when he talks about the production of that, he's talking about the instrumentalization of human life, of making it something that you can decide about it and you can gamble and use it as, as you see fit. And he's also talking about the material destruction of bodies and individuals and of entire populations. So uh, I think this phrase is really good because it really summarizes the concept of necropolitics. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, let me, so I don't get part of it wrong. Yeah, so it is the power and the capacity to dictate who may live and who must die. It really summarizes how, how necropolitics uh, uses the, the concepts of death and politics, starting from biopolitics, but taking this different approach to the taking the next step and focusing on the death aspect, which Foucault calls as an underside, but that's actually the emphasis that uh, in Ben sees to be more important to, to question and to discuss. So once again, I ask for your help with uh, examples of necropolitics in our daily society. What can you think of uh, based on what we just said? Uh, with self-driving cars, you have to choose who uh, might be killed in an accident. <laughs> yes. So technology can lead to a certain level of necropolitics. Yeah. Yes. And Sarah? Some governments deciding who gets to leave and who gets to be executed the criminal is starting to problem. Perfect. Anyone else? No? Okay, so th these are very good examples and I have some images here. So uh, when you think about death and causing the death of people and deciding about who lives and who dies, we can think uh, very quickly of war, like the situation helping in Ukraine right now. We can think about this uh, live stream executions of ISIS, uh, death, death penalties. These are all uh, examples of the concrete forms of necropolitics because we can see the direct association with death. By using these instruments, such as the death penalty, 
uh, the immediate uh, result and the immediate goal is to kill someone or to kill more than one person, right? Uh, but Imben also talks about uh, an indirect form of necropolitics or symbolic necropolitics when we don't see the re immediate relation to that, but it's still there and it's still causing people to die or not preventing that people die. So we can talk about uh, race violence, very attached to police violence, to discrimination in its various forms. Uh, we can also talk about a lot of uh, people in the prisons, uh, the prison populations around the world. This is an image from a, a prison in Brazil where the people don't have the basic living conditions, the basic human rights. And in Ben does talk about the creation of that world. Uh, it is uh, areas of the society or places or groups of society that are just uh, restricted to these death worlds and they are not entitled to basic rights to human live, living conditions. Uh, they are not directly killed, but they are not also allowed or entitled to live properly with not even the basics of health and hygiene or anything. Uh, so Mbem also called the, these peoples who habit the, these worlds believe in that because they are not being killed by the state or by the powerful, but it's, they are also not living properly. And the immigration situation, the refugee situation here also illustrates that very well, right? Uh, another example is the situation in hospitals where people don't get the proper health care. So the absence of government, the failure of public policies can be considered symbolic forms of necropolitics because if someone is not getting the proper treatment or the surgery they need because there is a lack of equipment or staff, it's a, a government failure that is preventing these people from leaving or at least from, from leaving how they should with all their basic rights. Uh, also inhumane work journeys like we, we hear a lot about in factories in Asia, for instance, can be another example of how the system is uh, provoking the death of its citizens of people and, and causing them to, or causing them to live like living that. So we can see that necropolitics is not something extreme that only happens in wars or from time to time, but it's actually present in our daily lives in many parts of the world and can be uh, applied and associated to very different social contexts, right? And now we're going to focus a bit on how necropolitics can be related to the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have Ben himself talking about it during these years. And a very uh, meaningful statement that uh, is that when he said that this is a virus that affects our capacity to breathe and it forces government and hospitals to decide who will continue breathing. So uh, it really shows how this pandemic, how this virus is connected to life, to the most basic thing about life is being able to breathe. And we're going to talk more about this further when we analyze the uh, some of the photos and, and, and how uh, policy and governmental decisions in the case of the pandemic really relate to the basic of life, like breathing, like having oxygen, okay? Uh, and then also said that the power to kill has been completely democratized in some, uh, in especially during some periods of the pandemic, especially during quarantine and the initial years when we didn't have vaccines, all of us had the potential to infect other people. So Inben has talked about a lot about uh, the power to kill and how sovereignty is represented by having the power to kill and deciding who could live and who should die. And for some times, uh, the pandemic uh, really uh, maximized this and exposed the, the presence of death in our society to a point uh, that all of us had to some scale the, the potential to have the power to kill. So it really changed how we see all of these problematics and all of these issues that we have talked about. Uh, 
so directing our geographic focus to the pandemic in Brazil, um, the quickest way to have a look at it is looking to in the, sorry, one second, in the who uh, dashboard, which has live information about uh, the pandemic and it's constantly updated. So we can see here that uh, Brazil right here uh, is in dark blue, which means that we had more than 5 million cases. Actually, the current count is more than 37 million confirmed cases and more than 700,000 deaths. Uh, the vaccination numbers look much better now, but they took a while to, to get there. So let me get back to the presentation. Um, so the pandemic was very severe in Brazil and the political aspect of the crisis was a big part of it, right? So when we look at the two gentlemen, ex-president Donald Trump and Bolsonaro, uh, it's not only the images that are similar, although they do give us some first clues of what we're talking about because the two of them have expressions that sort of reject or minimize the importance of masks. And this sort of translates their uh, response to the pandemic. Okay, and there are a lot of studies that actually compare and show the similarities between them. So we are analyzing their response to the pandemic, considering they are uh, right-wing populist politicians. And when, especially when facing a crisis, uh, populist politicians create framing strategies to try to deal with the situation. And Bernie and Tamaki call it uh, populist crisis framing strategies with the goals of, first of all, avoiding blame for everything bad that is happening during the crisis. So Bolsonaro did this when he blamed uh, local administrators for the economic crisis, when he blamed China for starting the pandemic and things like that. And another goal of the framing strategy is to claim, claim credit for the good measures that are being implemented during the crisis which Bolsonaro also did when he claimed credit for the emergency support for the poorest uh, people in Brazil who was approved by the Congress, uh, when he claimed credit for the good numbers of vaccination, although he delayed the acquisition of vaccinations by months and months. But this framing strategy is about creating the narratives and disseminating the narratives that help them in their own political agenda. So when they do that, uh, the politicians, when Bolsonaro did that, he also weakens democratic institutions like the judiciary system, like the other uh, powers of the Republic, other politicians and other governors, uh, like the prosecution office, because he starts this discourse, this speech, that he's above all of this and that everyone else is wrong and he segregates and creates more instability to a context that's already so messed with the health crisis and economic uh, issues and political and social issues that, as we know, all came together with the pandemic, right? So this really strategy is weak in democracy and they do so by fostering support on their, polit their own political basis. So talking a bit more about that, if we consider the arsenal of uh, the training strategies, a big part of it is disinformation. And quickly defining here, we consider disinformation, the intentional spread, the intentional release of misleading or false information with a specific purpose. So uh, Bolsonaro did talk badly about a lot of aspects involving the pandemic and its response. For instance, he didn't recommend and he talked badly about using masks, about social distancing. He also blamed the mainstream media for creating panic and he said the information wasn't accurate. He said that the numbers of the pandemic were being magnified. Um, he talked badly about the coronavirus vaccine questioning its Chinese origin without any scientific basis at all. Uh, he also uh, blamed local, uh, local administrators, like I said, for all the bad things happening during the pandemic. 
And he also created positive narratives. For instance, uh, in social media, he really uh, suggested and used a lot of social media, including robots, to put in practice these misinformation campaign, misinformation campaigns. So uh, he did official communications through his own social media. He encouraged people to follow and to 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 follow the news and to get information on dubious uh, channels such as YouTube channels that we don't know the origin, we don't know who's behind it, and WhatsApp and things like that. While he was uh, down downplaying and criticizing the mainstream media, um, he defended early treatments and drugs with without any proven efficiency, and they are now actually proven to be inefficient against COVID, like hydroxychloroquine. And by creating these narratives in the middle of these positive and negative narratives, what was actually happening was the delay in, in vaccines acquisition, the lack of equipments and medical supplies that were actually needed in the hospitals, and uh, charges of corruption in all of this acquisition, and all of these public expenses regarding the pandemic. So, and this is all uh, very uh, frequently, very intensely reported in the media, including the national media. Uh, Bolsonaro was actually accused of crimes against humanity in the international court for his pandemic response. And uh, all these facts that I was saying are, are heavily reported in the media. Uh, and a lot of scholars in Brazil have already made these associations and studied Bolsonaro's response and stated how it uh, is connected and how it reflects the concept of necropolitics. So for Alves, for instance, the posture of the government centralized in the figure of the president corroborates the notion of necropolitics coined by them that the state actively acts with strategies to let the population die. So you can see here uh, that some of the aspects that I have highlighted can constitute the concrete form of necropolitics, but uh, also uh, the symbolic and the indirect form of necropolitics can be seen when he chooses not to act, for instance, not to buy medicines, not to buy vaccines. He's just making a political decision to let the population die. Uh, Silva also says that Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro's politics uh, can be considered the, a practice of necropolitics when he provokes the conscious vulnerability of the majority poor, working, and Black populations. And this was further exposed during the pandemic. So shifting to photographies related to Bolsonaro in the media, uh, we're going to see now and discuss a bit about photojournalism and how it represented, how it portrayed Bolsonaro in relation to all of this that we have been talking about the pandemic. So my, my question here, what we want to analyze here is what was photojournalism's role in exposing the necropolitical actions and the inactions of the president? To do so, we are going to have a look uh, at photojournalism. Again, I'm not a, an expert in this topic, so I just want to pinpoint some uh, important basic things that photo, about photojournalism that are relevant for our analysis. So uh, photography is currently one of the main forms of communication. Uh, we can see, we can easily attest this primacy of the visual when you think about social media, when you think about the fact that people are always reading less and the amount and speed of information that we have access to. So uh, not rarely people will only look at a headline and an image and not read throughout a whole piece of news, right? Uh, so this has reinforced the importance of photography and of photojournalism. And uh, photojournalism is not only there to attest or to prove what is being said in the media, but it also adds vast amounts of material. It adds peoples and things and events to the news. 
that we could see our weakness by ourselves. So it has a very important role and it can have different uh, purposes in combination with the written text. And also we need to highlight the fact that the journalistic image is a transformation or reconstruction of the reality. And it is done and prepared by a professional photographer, by a photojournalist. And this image, this representation goes through his own filters, his professional and personal filters and values and directions that he gets from the media outlets. So there are a lot of uh, elements that lead up to a final journalistic photography, just like a journalistic text. So we are going to have a look at some of uh, the covers that I identified. And I was looking for uh, photographs in the covers of Folha de São Paulo, which is one of the biggest Brazilian newspapers during the first semester of 2021, because this was the worst, the most severe period of the pandemic in Brazil with a lot of successive uh, record highs in number of cases and deaths. And I did find 19 covers that associated Bolsonaro and the pandemic and the COVID-19 pandemic, not necessarily photos where Bolsonaro appears, but then the headline or the caption would mention him and create this relation between the written text and the images. Uh, so a few quick uh, data. Uh, it's the leading newspaper in the country for many decades, since the 1980s. Uh, it is part of a big media conglomerate and also a financial business that has a revenue value of more than a billion dollars a year. So that's just, uh, we're not going deep on this, but it's an interesting data to know. And also historically, Folha de São Paulo has been associated to right-wing politicians, but yet we're going to see that it was very critical of uh, Bolsonaro's response to the pandemic. Uh, the methodology for this analysis, just going through this very quickly, is the discourse analysis combined with Ernst Gombrich's uh, psychology of perception. Uh, this is a method created by Pereira Junior and Ferreira, Brazilian photojournalism researchers specific to, the, to apply uh, the discourse analysis to the analysis of photojournalistic images. And uh, the main parameters considered in the analysis are the enunciation and photographic discourses, the associations between the image and the verbal text, and also the photography role in the construction of the whole journalistic event and the journalistic discourse. So we will be looking at a few of these images and considering these elements. So the, the first thing I did was to classify the images, uh, considering the more specific topics that they cover associated with Bolsonaro and the pandemic. So we have uh, some covers that um, illustrate protests against President Bolsonaro, some that directly um, uh, illustrate cemetery and mourning and death. Some images are about protests and events in favor of the president, although in fewer in number. And also some images talk about the uh, measures suggested by scientific society during the pandemic and that Bolsonaro created a lot of polemics about, such as vaccination, chloroquine, and the use of masks. So uh, first we're gonna look at some of the images where Bolsonaro himself does appear in the images. So in this first two, we have him holding a baby and holding a child. He, this is, again, during the first semester of 2021, during the worst time of the pandemics where quarantine was recommended and the use of masks was mandatory and he's not wearing masks. Uh, and he's in public political gatherings in both pictures. In the third one as well, and so we can see how critical and how emphatic was the, the newspapers. Here are some of the captions of these images. So one says, without masks, before holding baby, Bolsonaro shook at least 144 hands in Goiás, which is a, a city near uh, Brazil's capital, and where he promoted during basically every weekend during this period, he went on the streets to walk and talk to the people 
to see uh, and assess how was the economic situation during the pandemic. Uh, the other uh, caption says, in an event, Bolsonaro encouraged a girl to take off her mask. That is the, this image that we can see right here. So making pretty clear uh, how he positioned himself about the sanitary measures, right? Uh, going forward, this is an early image with where Bolsonaro appears, but we have another layer here. It's also about masking. And we see a sequence of him getting irritated and taking off his mask. And he got uh, irritated and aggressive towards uh, a male reporter who asked him about why he was wearing a mask. And his response was to take off the mask and said, and he said, I mind my own business. If you don't want to wear a mask, you don't wear one. So again, making clear his positioning and uh, the newspaper was really exposing this contradiction between the recommendations of the scientific community, the measures that were necessary for the moment and his own positioning and what he was encouraging people to do or not to do. Right, and this image here is very meaningful because it really illustrates necropolitics and the fight for life during the pandemic. Uh, we are seeing for we are seeing here people literally fighting for oxygen. This is during a oxygen supply crisis in Manaus, which is the biggest city in the Amazon region, and uh, people were trying to buy for their own, by their own uh, oxygen cylinders to their relatives that were hospitalized and needed the oxygen to keep breathing. So we can see how it directly associates to what Mbem said that this is a virus that uh, makes, makes it difficult for us to breathe and then someone has to decide who keeps to continue breathing. And so when the government fails to provide the most basic thing that it's oxygen, it is decided that some of these people will not continue to breathe, and this is necropolitics. Uh, this has necropolitics written all over it, right? Uh, and here is the headline associated to this uh, to this photograph, which says, "After Bolsonaro's failure, the country depends on coronavirus." So uh, the journalistic discourse made sure to make an association and so the contrast between the situation where people were dying without oxygen and uh, the president was paying, was not uh, buying, acquiring other vaccines. And we depended now on the production of the coronavirus Chinese vaccines that he had denied before without any scientific basis or without any uh, reasonable explanation. Uh, here is a full cover. I know it's a bit small, but I want you to first have a look at the layout of the cover and calling attention to this big picture there that occupies a big portion of it. It's a picture of left-wingers uh, protesting against Bolsonaro's response to the pandemic. And down here, we have a basically empty square, a big empty square. Uh, which is very unusual for a newspaper cover. It's actually, uh, it's usually uh, packed and stacked with news and information, right? And uh, here's the image of the protest in Sao Paulo, the biggest city in the country. And here is the, the square and inside it, there's a text that says, until when are we going to die? If an empty cover causes discomfort, imagine the pain caused by the emptiness in the families of the 500,000 Brazilians who lost their lives to COVID-19. Okay, so the protest against the president is directly related to this, and this is making the connection uh, between the president's actions and the 500,000 deaths. Uh, again, another full cover, so you can see how much of it is occupied by the image. And this is a, a very meaningful image that um, illustrates that directly. Uh, let's have a bit of a closer look. So you're looking at a, a, a cemetery where someone is being buried and we have the workers uh, using protection clothes because again, it, this is during the worst time of the pandemics and vaccines weren't uh, really available at this time. 
Uh, and again, we look at the headline and it mentions Bolsonaro directly. It says, pandemic skidding like never before, and Bolsonaro talks about mini me. So, again, the contrast between the situation where people were dying by thousands and his inactions and what he was saying. Uh, here's another picture of a cemetery. So, we can see, let me try to hear. Yeah. So, uh, in the left here, this is the, the original area of the cemetery the, uh, before the trees. And here are a lot of new graves that they uh, dug uh, very quickly because they knew there was demand for it. And this is only a couple, a couple months later, all these new graves were already occupied. So again, this is showing how fast things were, were going, how serious was the situation. Uh, and the photograph illustrates it better than a written text. It's actually showing like, how can you question if people are dying when you have an image like that in, in a few months of difference, right? So looking through the lenses of photojournalism, photojournalism we can see that uh, Folha de São Paulo, the, the journalistic discourse of this newspaper associated Bolsonaro to uh, inaction during the pandemic, to disrespect of sanitary measurements, of safety measurements, um, to protests. He took people during uh, quarantine times, during very sensitive and hard times to go to the streets and protest, risking their lives. And on the other side, he was also promoting political gatherings. So not only his politics, his uh, management decisions were reflecting necropolitics, but his presence himself when he went to an event without wearing a mask, without saying that if he was vaccinated or not when the, the vaccine was available. Uh, he, was, he himself was part of what Mbem said that the, when he said that the power to kill had been democratized, he had this potential to infect other people and he shows uh, not to act on it or to act in, in a way that uh, he just accepted and, and kept uh, politicizing this risk, right? So he was associated to this respect, to protest, and also directly to death, especially when you see those more direct images of people fighting for oxygen, of burials, of people uh, in cemeteries, of people... Uh, suffering from their losses and their relatives and things like that. So what we can conclude by this is that the necropolitical aspects of Bolsonaro's right-wing politics already existed, but they were further exposed and magnified during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we talked about in, in some examples of, um, in some examples of uh, necropolitics, about the symbolic necropolitics and how social inequalities, the lack of proper health care, the lack of proper habitation and basic rights can configure necropolitics. This already existed in Brazil. It's already existed in many parts of the world, but the pandemic really exposed and amplified this so we can have this different view. Like, and, and the images help us to see this more clearly, right? And that's the second point that I want to highlight that photojournalism contributed to expose this reality to the readers. So uh, the images were very relevant. Like we saw, it, they occupied a big space of the covers of the main uh, newspaper in the country. So they were relevant and they were very frequent during this period. So only in six months, we could uh, think of 19, identified 19 covers that associated directly the pandemic and the president. Um, so the image illustrated added information and contextualized the news, not only uh, proving what the headlines were saying, but actually adding information and adding uh, the urgency and adding to, the, to our comprehension of the severity of the situation, as we saw. Um, and Folha de São Paulo really highlighted this contrast between the inactions of the ex-president and the pandemic situation 
the, graph, the severity of what was going on and what he was actually saying or doing or not doing. So these are the, the main points that I wanted to highlight this afternoon. Thank you so much. And I do want to hear other VR thoughts and observations. Thank you very much, Andre. That was a very interesting talk. Anyone joining online uh, who wants to ask a question, uh, raise your hand and we can invite you to speak. If you don't feel comfortable speaking, put your question in the chat and we'll, we'll read it here at our end. Um, I'll start if I may. Uh, so, Andre, I'm kind of uh, interested in Bolsonaro's ability to make, yeah, come into the you perfect, <laughs> to make himself an object of um, the politics himself, like as a person. Whether it be not, whether it be you know, some of the events unmasked, or and I learned more recently that he was living in Florida from October until I think just now the last couple of weeks, yeah. and only now did he return to uh, Brazil. So it almost gave the impression like um, like there had been a coup and that the election was illegitimate and he was living in exile. You know what I mean? Like he was using that as a trope. I wonder if you can have any comments on his ability to make himself the object of news. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's a very interesting question and it speaks a lot to what uh, I talked about framing strategies and how populists are always creating narratives and trying to spread these narratives using their support base to, to dominate what's being said in the media, in the social uh, media especially. And the social media actually created an environment uh, that is more friendly to this kind of narratives that uh, appear to be independent, but are actually fostered by robots, by politicals, politicians who, who pay to, to have this information disseminated and, and so that it gets to people and then people uh, transmit it again. So it's uh, this whole disinformation thing is very well used by politicians to have their own narrative uh, dominating the, the media and the information space. And I, I think that uh, what happened uh, in the recent years is that uh, right-wing politicians like Trump, like Bolsonaro, uh, made uh, took advantage of this scenario and knew how to use it better to promote their thinkings and their narratives. So he keeps doing it even after uh, finishing his presidency, even after the election. He keeps trying to uh, uh, but into the context, into the, the, the information uh, space, different narratives that cast doubts upon the, the election, upon uh, a lot of things upon that. Yeah, and he did it a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic, during uh, he questioned the, the, the number of cases, the number of deaths the number of people who got vaccinated and all of this. So yeah. Yeah, well, that's interesting. And it's kind of interesting how he's able to keep inserting himself in the news just by- Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you very much, yeah. Andre. There are, uh, uh, just yeah, that yeah. there are a lot of investigations about Bolsonaro's usage oh. of AI and oh. uh, of using a public servant to promote his own interests on social media and uh, this is, is, is something systemic and that he has implemented for many years and it's other investigation in, uh, in a lot of different spheres. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so AI is not only the school of undergraduates at Western to help them finish writing their essays at the 11th hour, yeah. but also in Bumble's narrow. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, no, thank you, that's very interesting. Um, does anyone in person have any questions? Traditionally, historically, Poland Sao Paulo was very associated to right wing politicians. What happened is that uh, Bolsonaro, and like we call it the Bolsonarism, Bolsonarism uh, the, the, his political movement really shifted uh, even what we know as right and left in Brazil. So uh, we call him uh, extremist, uh, extreme right politician. 
And many people, many of his supporters try to call, for instance, Lula extremist left. But that's not something that really sums up to, to an even result. So when he shifted that, a lot of people and a lot of media and a lot of institutions that used to support center right uh, politicians, uh, they reached a wall because Bolsonaro went too far. So uh, I, I guess that's what happened with Politico Paulo in, like, in, a, in a broader analysis. And this is basically the main media narrative about the pandemic in Brazil. Uh, if you consider the mainstream media, uh, this, uh, I do believe the narratives would be very similar. Uh, an interesting thing is that we have CNN Brazil for a couple of years now. It's, it's not, I think it's been uh, maybe three or four years we have CNN. And CNN in the USA, as we know, is very, uh, was for some time very attached to Trump and to right-wing politicians. So it was a big question, like a big doubt when it started in Brazil, how it was going to, to portray the news and to position itself. And they do, uh, they do have a positioning of giving like more space to both sides and, and giving the same space to right-wing and left-wing politicians and things like that. But they also criticized a lot uh, Bolsonaro's response to the pandemic. They also criticized a lot now the coup attempt and the attempt to, to, um, to question the, the elections. Because what I think that happens is uh, he crossed the line, and so many supporters, even of the what we call the right in Brazil, uh, can't go and follow him and, and keep supporting. Thank you very much. Um, you have a question? <laughs> anyone, anyone in person? So, does anyone online have any questions? Uh, we have Pam McKenzie who put in a response to an example for necropolitics for organ transplant lists, which I think is a great example, but we don't have any questions yeah, as of yet. Great. That's a very good answer. Okay, thank you. So uh, we'll give maybe people online a suspenseful moment to raise their hands. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, Andrea, I have a question for uh, for you, if I may. Um, so you're, you're in your first year here at Films. Yes. So, uh, what do you plan on doing for your comprehensive exams and ultimately for dissertation, like will you touch on, will you stick with this topic or do you want to branch elsewhere? Yeah, so that, that's what I, I would say in the beginning, this is a bit out of my comfort zone yeah. because my, my main uh, focus, and I think that the focus of my dissertation is going to be Brazilian environmental issues. Yeah. But although it is a different topic, it also has so many connections yeah. because this information is also a big part of Brazilian environmental issues. And also Bolsonaro uh, has a big part in the motivation of why I want to address Brazilian environmental issues, because the last, in the, during the last years, during his government, we had a lot of setbacks in Brazilian environmental policy and a lot of disinformation regarding it. So uh, there's a lot of connections. The, the connections that I draw from here is the public communication, the media analysis, and uh, disinformation, misinformation, and populism, and how to analyze all of that. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. It sounds like uh, Bolsonaro, if he is no longer the focus of your research, he may uh, warrant chapter, perhaps. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. So uh, it looks like we still don't have any questions online, and the final call for questions in person. And, uh, yeah, so do, do you view a, a difference between how necropolitics function in non-populist societies as in populist societies? Do you think uh, that there's a, a, a major qualitative difference in how that's deployed? Or is this something that we just see normally in capitalism? I think we do see it in capitalism, but it, uh, it can appear very differently depending on the context. Uh, so in populist countries, uh, although the people are not actually in control in many cases, there is this concern of uh, letting people to think that they are in control and that the government is representing the people. And uh, when it happens, uh, the forms of necropolitics are more concealed. So for instance, in Brazil, I did show uh, the images of the prison population uh, the situation in hospitals that already happened like before the pandemic. 
this happens, but there are a lot of groups of human rights who try to stop it. There's a lot of fighting, so it's not very in the open and it's not imposed. As different than uh, non populist places or uh, countries, or if you think of dictatorships and things like that, they will be uh, probably ex uh, applying necropolitics in a more exposed way, in a more imposed way, so that it becomes clear. Also, like uh, the examples that we saw of the refugees. Uh, of uh, ISIS and executions and war, so that, that becomes more clear. But then we have to see that uh, maybe the symbolic part of the necropolis is even more serious because it's there like every day and uh, we don't often notice it, right? Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Jack, for the question. Thank you, Andre. Um, if it looks like, if Matt Ward looks like he's a little bit different today, that's because he is. He's made special thanks to uh, to Jack for filling in and for handling the AP aspect today. Jack is a master of all trades. Um, thank you to uh, Dean Henderson and the faculty of FIMS for their continued support of this graduate run series. And thank you to those faculty members in attendance today. I refer uh, Pam McKenzie online and Melissa here in person. Um, and thank you to everyone. I'm I've been I have an apology to make. I've been telling people all day that our next creations. Is on April 22nd, but uh, I'm going to take the point of it's on April 20th. So, two, two, two Thursdays from now, same time, same place, uh, we will gather to discuss uh, to hear a presentation on the role of influencers on Instagram and Twitter during the 2022 and 2023 women's rights protest in Iran preliminary findings. So, that's in two weeks. So, there's no mediations next week. I hope everyone will be okay with that. And uh, Everyone has a happy holiday weekend. Thank you very much. And thank you again to Andre. Thank you so much. Uh, and Pam's then apologies, uh, which are appreciated. But thank you for showing up, Pam. Your support was greatly yes, appreciated. Thank you.